Hey guys, and welcome back finally to episode number five of the How to Ace Your Unseen Case video series, where I take you on a whistle stop tour of everything you need to know for your unseen cases, vivas, oral exams um, at dental school. This is really annoying. Um, it's my second take. I was filming for two hours and then my camera on my phone just, just decided to go AWOL and, and corrupt, so I lost all that footage. So, had a bowl of cereal, feeling re-energised and, and ready to crack on. First and foremost, I just want to say a big a big apology and a big sorry to, to everyone, obviously, because it's, it's been such a long time in between, um, in between videos. Uh, just had a lot going on, unfortunately, and I just couldn't get them out. Um, had foundation year, so it's obviously ramped up towards the end of the year. Decided to run a marathon in Ibiza that I had to train for, and also spent a lot of time building my portfolio um, and applying for jobs, um, so which took up a lot of time. Pleased to announce, though, that yeah, landed a really good job in in Southwest London. Really happy. So I'm going to be starting there in September, moving back to the to the big city. Um, and working under some amazing dentists who who hopefully are going to take me under their wing and and teach me teach me you know you know the ways in dentistry because I've only scratched the surface and and there's so much more to learn which is which is really exciting. So before we get into it, today's is going to be about all things indirect restorative um, and and a little bit of treatment planning. It's something that a lot of people have asked for, and the engagement has been absolutely amazing from you guys. People, you know, subbing, liking, commenting on the YouTube videos. I've had so many people Instagramming me um, just to say thank you, which has been really nice to say how helpful it's been. Um, DMing me loads of questions. Some people have been sending me voice notes of their answers, and I've been giving them them feedback on there. So it's been really good to engage with with a lot of people who. You know, have used them, learned a little bit, and and you know, want to do the best they can. So yeah, please feel free to message me. My Instagram is Tiller Talks Teeth, and my TikTok is Tiller Talks Teeth as well. So my my DMs are always open. Cringe, um, but yeah, I love love hearing your messages, getting your feedback, and and interacting with you guys. So yeah, without further ado, I guess let's get stuck in. Yeah, so today essentially is going to be everything fixed and removable pros. Um, so any restorative work that essentially requires a lab. It's going to be very similar structure to the rest of the videos where we go through a lecture, if you can call it a lecture. Um, and then at the end, there's a, there's a case to go through as well. What is going to differ is, unlike the other things, there's not really many guidelines that you can follow for fixed and removable pros. Um, a lot of the information I've got is from... Um, some textbooks, obviously learning lectures at, at university, clinical experience this year, and then a few guidelines. Um, so the most notable one being the British Society of Restorative Dentistry. Other than that, yeah, the things I've mentioned before and, and a lot of clinical papers as well. So those are kind of the resources that you're going to get your information from. But I'll mention them throughout where I kind of get them from. Um, so yeah, I guess let's get stuck into it. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is tooth surface loss, which is probably going to take the most amount of time. Um, it's something that we see day to day in dentistry, so it's something we need to be aware of. And I think it can be quite daunting. It's still really daunting to me now because there are so many factors to comprehend. But I think what you've got to remember is, and I say it in every video, is the examiner is not looking for a world-class restorative dentist yet. What they're looking for is... A safe beginner is someone who can identify etiology, can conduct suitable, you know, special investigations, and then can treatment plan, treatment plan the basics um, and kind of make a structured, um, structured treatment plan for that patient. So I'm going to break it down into bite-sized chunks of all the things that I've just spoken about. Um, make sure that you understand those clearly. And then they're where you're going to get the bulk of your marks in an unseen case. And especially if you put them all together. So the first thing to touch upon is the, the types of tooth surface loss. I think, you know, you'll get patients day in, day out that come in with tooth wear. If you can look at their clinical presentation and their clinical history and you can find the etiology, then it's, it's so, so useful and it's something you need to show the examiner that you're aware of. If you know the etiology and you can find out, then you can manage that etiology and you can stop things from deteriorating um, any further. I think the important thing to understand in tooth wear is that 
the patient that sits on your chair, very rarely will it only be one of the four things. Tooth wear is multifactorial, so you've got to try and get out of tunnel vision. Even if you know that a patient is a bruxist, you've still got to look at the other fa factors as well, because things like abrasion, erosion, etc., they're all going to play a part. It's not just going to be that bruxism. So these four on the screen, they're basically your bread and butter in terms of, in terms of etiologies of, of tooth surface loss. The first one is erosion, which essentially is tooth wear caused by chemical, so acid wear, but it's not from a bacterial cause. Um, essentially, it's from two sources. It's extrinsic, so these are your dietary acids, so citrus fruits, fizzy drink, beer, wine, things like that. Or your intrinsic acids, which are, are ones that that come from within, so patients who vomit a lot, perhaps in bulimia, or patients who have um, like gourd, like acid reflux and things like that. They'll present slightly differently. In a patient who has, you know, internal intrinsic reflux, you'll often get wear of the, of the palatal surfaces of the teeth, because that's where the acid, when it comes up from the throat, that's the surface that it hits. But yeah, know those both causes. You, more, you also might get asked, when addressing this is is you know at what level or what ph in the mouth does does wear occur and it's important to understand something called the critical ph which essentially is the ph at which acid acid the, the acidic ph at which enamel will start to demineralize so at a certain value if you hit that value and go below it that's when your tooth wear is going to start and that value in the mouth is 5.2 to 5.5 so you have something called the stephen curve which essentially is the you know the the fluctuation of of ph in the mouth if you drink something fizzy or you have you know you know reflux or something like that and the ph drops to that critical ph 5.2 to 5.5 and below that's when the enamel is going to start demineralizing and it's going to demineralize until the ph goes back above that critical ph so just understand that you might get asked that or you can chuck that in for a, for a few cheeky bonus marks Attrition is the second one, and attrition is basically tooth wear from contact of teeth together. So you have, essentially you have two types. You have attrition, which is where your incisors hit each other, so commonly in an edge-to-edge -edge occlusion, and you'll get chipping of the anterior teeth. Or you can have bruxism, which essentially is where a patient will grind their teeth together and those teeth will wear down. So two types of, of attrition. Abrasion is where you get tooth wear contact of something that isn't teeth so we're talking about things like someone who might brush too hard where they brush too hard they're wearing the teeth down someone who might have a tongue piercing might have have lingual wear on the lower anterior teeth um, and hard foods as well if you chew food or, or for example if people who chew um, pan and beetle nut a lot of it will be quite abrasive so when they're chewing together you'll find a lot of them will have have flatter posterior teeth the fourth one to talk about is abfraction, which is becoming a bit of a myth, but it's still good to understand. Abfraction presents very similarly to abrasion. You get these kind of um, smooth lesions at the, at the cervical areas of the teeth by the gingival margins. And essentially, it's caused every time you bite together or, or you grind, it will send a flexural force along that tooth. And the cervical region is essentially where that flexural force will not so much congregate, but at that point is the weakest point. So you'll get this concavity forming. And there's a lot of new things saying that abfraction, is it really a thing? Um, but for the purpose of the exam, have that as one of your four to understand. Also, if you want a cheeky little um, stat to throw in, normal physiological tooth wear for your average Joe person is 0.2 to 0.5 millimeters over 10 years. So we've got the etiology of tooth wear. What are the effects of tooth surface loss on a patient? So the number one thing that a patient typically complains about is poorer aesthetics. And this comes from multiple different things. If you look at the picture and you imagine that you're wearing teeth down, there's a reduced clinical crown height. And not only does that have make the tooth look shorter because they are shorter, <laughs> obvious statement. What happens is sometimes, and we'll talk about this more later, is when you bite together, a patient will overclose. So if you've lost that space between these teeth, if you bite together, these the distance here for me with, with no real wear, if you have wear and you close more, that distance will shorten, so you have a reduced facial profile. So you can have reduced clinical crown height, reduced face height, 
Teeth can often appear more yellow because if you wear away the enamel, which is the translucency that gives the teeth their whiteness, you see the dentine that shows through more and the dentine is typically more yellow. So people will complain of their teeth being more yellow. And they'll also come in and complain of chips, fractures, uneven teeth and, and things like that. The second most common complaint is probably dentine hypersensitivity. If you imagine in a wear case, you've got rid of that enamel. The enamel is a protective part of the tooth and you've exposed the dentine tubes. Every time this patient has a cold drink, there's a change in hydrostatic pressure in these tubules, the nerve gets irritated and they get this short, sharp pain. Alongside dentine hypersensitivity, if we get into more extensive, chronic, severe tooth wear, you can start to have reversible and irreversible pulpitis and you can even have um, pulp devitalization as well. A little bit more complex, but also very relevant, is when you change the bite, like on the left-hand side, it can cause occlusion problems, mastication problems, um, loss of function, and also TMJ problems as well. And finally, not really a patient issue, but more of an issue for us is when you lose this enamel, it's a lot harder to bond to these teeth. If you have reduced clinical crown height, there's a lot less tooth to bond to. Um, you've got to remember that Dental materials, restorative materials, are designed to bond well to enamel. So if you have less enamel, you might not get as an effective bond and less longevity for those restorations. So special investigations are next. And I think we already know the etiology, so we probably should have done these, um, done these earlier on. But again, you'll see these a lot on my videos. It is bread and butter stuff. Some of these things should be in absolutely every special investigation you do, regardless of what you're you're looking for. Some of them are a little bit more specific to, to tooth wear cases. So the general ones that you should be doing for every single patient, every question you get asked on special investigations, plaque and bleeding, always say that, chuck it in there, there's no harm in throwing it in there. That's to assess for oral hygiene. You should be doing an oral hygiene assessment and this is really important in a patient with wear, especially if they've got abrasion. You want to identify if they're using a manual or an electric brush, are they using an abrasive toothpaste? Are they using too much pressure when they're brushing? If you ask them to bring their toothbrush in and their toothbrush looks like that on the right hand side, you know they're scrubbing away their enamel. You know it's probably contributing to their wear. Diet analysis is something else that you should be doing for every single patient, for caries risks and things like that. But again, in tooth wear, it's super, super important. You need to be able to understand, you know, is there, is there erosion? Is it from the dietary cause? So you want to do things like a, a 24 hour or a four day recall um, just to understand, you know, is there something in the etiology coming from the from the diet? A 24 hour is great because it's it's more accurate. The patient's less likely to lie if you're asking them on the spot what they ate yesterday. However, it may not give an accurate representation of the whole week. A four day diet, which is two weekdays and, and the weekend, is a bit more of an accurate representation but is a patient filling that in at home, telling you that they had four cans of Coke on a Saturday, or are they just going to slightly uh, slightly change those numbers just because they feel a little bit bad about it? An audit C is something that essentially is a quick screening tool for the amount of alcohol that someone drinks, so that's very similar to, to diet analysis in finding dietary erosion, or actually intrinsic erosion if they're vomiting when they, when they drink as well. The BWE on the bottom left, now this is more specific to tooth wear, this is the basic erosive wear examination. And essentially it's like a BPE for erosion. You split the mouth into sextants and you score the teeth based on the level of erosion based on the appearance. You add up the scores and that kind of guides your management and your treatment planning much like a BPE does. The only downside of this obviously that it looks at erosion only. Whereas the tooth wear index, which is next to it, which is a kind of a more comprehensive um, analysis of tooth wear in a patient. So this is the Smith and Knight tooth wear index. You don't have to know it inside out. Just be aware of it and kind of the things that it measures. And that's kind of a tool that you would use in, in, um, in a tooth wear case. Clinical photos and study casts, they're not really to determine the etiology. They're more special investigations for monitoring and also for to help with treatment planning. Clinical photos are great because you can show the patient their mouth. You know, they might see their teeth every day, but they might not really see their teeth, um, which is quite, quite deep, actually. But if you show them a picture and you explain, you know, here's the wear, 
then you know you might open their eyes to it. Or you can take a photo at six months, then take a photo at 12 months, 18 months, and you can monitor the level of tooth wear a patient has had. Similarly with study casts, you can have a physical, um, physical model of the patient's teeth to show them the wear. You can use it to track wear like you would in clinical photos and, and monitor the difference. But you can also use study cast to help treatment plan. You can do a diagnostic wax up to show the patient what it might look like or a wax up to get a putty stent when you're doing composite buildups. Really useful tools. And if you combine them all, it will help you, you know, help you find your etiology and also help you with your treatment planning. So that moves us nicely onto treatment planning. And you're going to see this slide you know, there or thereabouts a lot of times in this presentation. And you're going to see things like this on all of the videos because treatment planning, the concept of it always follows the same kind of um, template and rules. You want to find out things like what are the patient's expectations? What's the etiology? What's the restorability of the teeth? And then finally make a treatment plan. Emergency, prevention, restorability, restorative, and then maintenance. And it doesn't really change for tooth wear. Before you even go into a patient's mouth, you want to understand their expectations. I can't tell you how many patients walk into my practice, my practice, into my room and sit on my chair with that severe wear that you saw a couple of slides ago and you highlight it to them, but then they're not bothered about their aesthetics and they're not bothered or they don't have any symptoms. So not every patient that comes into your practice with tooth wear is going to want it addressed. They're just going to be happy to accept it, monitor, readdress it in six months. It doesn't mean that in six months time they're going to be in the same boat. So you still want to bring the conversation up every time. But you want to know, does this patient actually want treatment? And if the patient does want treatment, what are their expectations? Do they understand their etiology? Do they understand that it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a lot of work? It might fail depending on the etiology. Um, and things like that. So if you know their expectations, you can manage them appropriately as well. Second thing to do, again, before you get stuck into the, uh, into the rebuild, is you need to manage the etiology. If you know the etiology and you don't address it, things are not going to work. Your, rest your restorative work is going to fail. Things are going to deteriorate. And, and you know more wear is going to occur. For example, if you have a patient who's a bruxist and you know they're a heavy bruxist and you don't address that and you give them a, um, a lovely set of porcelain veneers, they're just going to break. They're just going to they're just going to knock them off at night time when they're when they're grinding away again. And it's only going to get worse. You've got to kind of think of it as it's very similar to if you're managing someone with a lot of caries. You're not just going to jump in and restore those teeth. You're going to address why the caries there. How can we prevent that happening again in the future? And it's no different with tooth wear. Once you've got the expectations and the etiology down, then you can start to think about restorability. And restorability, again, in tooth wear, exactly the same as everything else. Go and listen to episode two with special investigations and, and treatment planning. It follows the exact same core values. Do we have good periodontal support? Do we have a good pulpal endodontic status? Do we have enough tooth tissue for what we want to do? If you don't have one of these things, the tooth can't be restored. If you have a beautiful crown, lots of enamel, plenty of clinical crown height, you have a pulp that is asymptomatic and a, and a periapical area that is pathology free, patho pathology free, but you have a periodontal pocket, eight millimeters around the tooth and bone loss to the apex, that tooth is unrestorable. So you need to address all three and make sure that all three fit the criteria of restorability to move on to the, to the planning phase, essentially. Specific mention to the tooth tissue um, in regards to wear, and we'll talk about more of it later on. Things you need to consider are the clinical crown height. Have you got enough tooth tissue to bond to or have you got enough crown to actually sit a crown on retentively? If you don't, you need to consider something like clinical crown height. Have you got enough enamel to bond to? Again, enamel, enamel bonds really well to restorative materials, dentine and cementum, not so much. Have you got a ferrule? If you're putting a crown on, again, we'll touch on that later. And are your margins subgingival or supragingival? This is going to affect your treatment plan. It's going to affect your restorative material. It's going to affect your aesthetics um, and preps and things like that. 
Finally, last but not least, and this is something that we're going to, I'm going to try and cover as best I can in the next sections, um, had a good bit of planning on the, on the video we just lost, is occlusion. Very similarly to managing the etiology, you need to address the occlusion because if you don't address the occlusion and you do all this fancy work, the likelihood is, is it's going to fail and the patient's not going to be able to tolerate it. So you need to find out if they've got any parafunction, what class their incisors are in, are they in ICP, RCP, and things like that before you then start doing your, um, your restorative work. Okay, so you have to bear with me, and I'm going to really try and make this as simple as possible. There are three concepts of occlusion that, to get those distinction high-end marks, you need to have a brief understanding of. You don't need to know it inside out. I don't know occlusion inside out, and I'm not going to know occlusion inside out for years and years and years. It's so, so complex. But if you can get your head around these three concepts and why they're important, in especially in a toothwear case, and you can mention those, then that's going to bump your marks up high. So I'll try and go as slow as I can and make it as understandable as I can. But if you need to ask any questions about this because it is complex, then please fire away on my Instagram and I'm, I'm happy to happy to answer those. So the first thing we need to talk about in occlusion is, is guidance. And essentially, the jaw does not just go, when you're eating, it doesn't just go up and down like this. The jaw goes side to side, left and right, diagonally. It's not just in one plane of movement. So if you imagine, I don't know, for example, you do a restoration, you get the patient to bite up and down and it's, it's, it's nice, um, nice and even contacts. That's great. But the patient might come back three days later and say, oh, my filling's chipped off felt like I was only biting on there and you say that's strange it's because you haven't taken into consideration the movements from left to right essentially and that is what's known as your guidance and if you have good a good guidance scheme it will protect the other teeth and the restorations you do so to put it simply we're looking for something called a mutually protected occlusion where the contacts of the teeth on lateral excursion left and right protect the rest of the teeth. So if we take the images on the screen, for example, and the dots on the teeth on the on the left and, and on both the models, if you imagine you've got articulated paper between the jaws, the dots are when you bite together. The little lines, for example, on the canine, on the canine guidance, that's the mark the articulating paper makes on, on left and right lateral excursion. So let's look at canine guidance, for example. And this is a really good occlusal scheme to protect the rest of the teeth. So canine guidance essentially is when you have your canines like this and you go lateral excursion, what they do is they slide along each other. And when they're edge to edge like this, the rest of the teeth should be discluded and not touching. So if you can imagine the, the model on the left-hand side, and you've put articulating paper in there, and you've said to the patient, can you grind over to, to one side? You can see that the line is only on that one canine. None of the other teeth are touching. The, the marks on those teeth are for when the patient was in static, um, static occlusion. So if you look at my canines now, what you can see is when I grind along them, from side to side, and you're going to see my dirty amalgam down there. Look at that, that is awful. If you grind to one side on excursion, you can see that absolutely no other teeth are touching. So I'll show you that again. So if you look, there's a gap between all the other teeth. And what that does, just being on those canine teeth on the other side as well, not so much on this side, but it excludes the teeth. So you could imagine if you were to build up the anterior teeth and you had canine guidance, every time you went left or right, because you've got that gap there, the anterior teeth aren't hitting. But if you don't have canine guidance, and you restore the anterior teeth with composite or whatnot. And every time you grind to the side and they hit like that, bang, 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 they're much more likely to fail. So canine guidance is a scheme that will protect all the other teeth when you're going left to right. And the reason canines are brilliant for it is because the shape of them allows them to slide in one plane. 
They have the longest root of any tea, so they're nice and strong, and it will just protect everything else. So canine guidance is great. Basically, where the canines come together, on one side, nothing else is touching, and it's all protected. Unfortunately, not everyone has canine guidance, and that's where group function comes into play. And group function is the other occlusal scheme, which protects everything else. And essentially what it means is, and you can see from the model here is, in group function, when you go on lateral excursion, you have nice even contacts on that side, slightly heavier contacts on the posterior and, sl on the, and lighter on the anterior to protect all of those teeth. So what you want, for example, is if your jaw comes together like this and you grind over to one side, you want only lines of articulation to be on the side you grind towards. And that's called a working side interference. So if I'm to grind to the left in group function, I only want my left teeth contacting. I don't want my right teeth contacting. If I was to grind to the left and have articulating paper in here, and I had good group function, these guys wouldn't touch. If I was to grind to the left with articulating paper here and these touched, that's called a non-working side interference, the opposite side to what I'm grinding at. And that's not good for occlusion. That's when you're more likely to get breakages, parafunction, occlusal problems. So canine guidance, and they're the only two teeth that contact, spaces everywhere. Group function, if I go to the left, I only want the left teeth touching. If I go to the right, I only want the right teeth touching. Simple as that. If you can get that concept about how you can protect everything else, then for example, in an answer, if you're saying, say we get to the restorative phase and you say I would do you know, bonding on the anterior teeth, I would ensure that we've got canine guidance to ensure that I can protect that bonding from chipping, fracturing and breaking and things like that. That's your distinction answer. So ICP and RCP are the second is the second occlusal thing that, that I think you need to understand. And essentially, it's a reproducible position that you're going to get the patient built that get the patients restored into, if that makes sense. So one of them, ICP, is completely dependent on tooth to tooth contact. That's how you find your position. RCP is dependent on the position of the jaw being re reproducible. And I'll try and explain this in, in more detail now. So ICP essentially is something called maximal intercuspal position. And it's a position at which the teeth determine where the jaws meet. So if you look at the, the picture on the left and you've got plenty of contacts there, if you were to take the mandibular cast and the maxillary cast, and if you were to seat them together one or a 100,000 times, because there's enough occlusal contact, every time you seat them together, it'll be exactly the same. It'll be dependent on where those teeth sit because there's only one configuration that you can get all of those teeth touching, your maximum intercuspation. So in a patient like, like myself where I've got enough contacts, every time I bite together, I'll be biting into that, into that ICP. And that's for patients where you can get two casts in your hands and you can do it every single time. If you have a patient like that, then when you're restoring them, you would conform to their original, original occlusion, occlusion, which is their ICP. So it's called the conformative approach. If, like the, like the picture on the right, you, you've lost contacts or teeth are heavily worn down, so, for example, in a wear case, you would lose, you know, your cusp height and your fissures and your ridges. If you've got those casts and every time you put them together, it was slightly different. It didn't fit together properly like the cast on the right hand side. You can't accurately reposition that based on where the teeth meet. So you have to reposition or reorganize the occlusion into something that's reproducible and independent of where the teeth touch. And that's where RCP comes in. So essentially, RCP is the first contact of the teeth. So the first contact of any, anywhere in the mouth when the condyle is in the most anterior and superior position of the fossa. So RCP is a reproducible position based on the position of the condyles in the jaw.
And it's how you in your lab, when you communicate it, it's how they'll articulate the maxillary jaw to the mandibular jaw so that every time the patient closes, even though you don't have that tooth to tooth contact, it's reproducible based on the position of the jaw, not the position of the teeth. That's why it's called the reorganized approach. And it's it's difficult concept to get your head around, especially if uh, yourself, you'll probably have ICP. But imagine you've got those casts. You have to think, I can't, picture two, I can't get that together the same as every time. So I need to find a way that the patient will be able to close together every time, independent of what the teeth do. And that's your RCP. So in a nutshell, ICP, determined by tooth to tooth contact, maximum intercuspation. If you've got ICP, you will conform to that. If you don't have ICP, you need to reorganize the patient into RCP, which is independent of the tooth position, where the condyle is at the most anterior and superior position in the fossa. And last but not least, and I hope you're still with me on occlusion, um, we need to think about the vertical dimensions of the face. So I mentioned earlier that when you have tooth wear, you can close a lot more and you can reduce the height of your facial profile, which will change your aesthetics. So we need to understand a couple of terms when we're talking about vertical dimensions. And when we talk about vertical dimensions, essentially it's the measurement from the filtrum of the nose down to the chin. Okay, that's the measurement that you take. And if you want to get fancy, you can use a Willis gauge or calipers and, and things like that. So we need to talk about two things. We need to talk about one is the resting vertical dimension where the patient's jaw is at rest and there's a slight gap between the teeth. So you measure from there to there. And then you talk about the occlusal vertical dimension, which is where you're biting together and you measure that distance. And that distance will be slightly smaller because you don't have the gap between the teeth. But remember OVD because that, that becomes important later. What you do then is you take your RVD and you subtract your OVD and that will give you the distance between the two teeth when you're at rest. And this is called the freeway space. Now the freeway space in a normal patient without wear is two to four millimeters and the freeway space alongside the OVD when we're treatment planning in wear, understanding how this can change is really, really important. It can basically do one of two things and I'm going to try and explain it with my hands. Um, so we've got patient A. Patient A is, is me. Patient A has no tooth wear. So these are patient A's teeth. And you can imagine that the gap between my fingers here, that's your freeway space, that's your two to four millimeters, okay? Every time I close, that's it. RVD, OVD, little bit of freeway space in between it. So every time I close, that's your normal patient. Imagine patient B, okay? Teeth here, teeth here, but they've got some tooth wear. So what's happened in patient B is the gap between the top teeth and the bottom teeth has increased, an increase in freeway space, okay? So patient B, tooth wear, and an increase in freeway space. Now with this patient, these teeth remain in place in the jaw, okay? So now you imagine, look at the distance between these fingers in A, and look at the difference in B. If you imagine how much further this patient has to close, if they've got wear, you can imagine that the bottom jaw to the top jaw, the distance is going to be shorter because they're closing their jaws more. So patient B has an increase in freeway space and when they close, a reduction in OVD. Now bear this in mind for later on, this becomes important, okay? So patient B has wear but no movement, increase in freeway space, the gap between my fingers, reduction in OVD because they close their jaw together more. Now, just to throw another spanner in the works, we've got patient C. Now, patient C, okay, normal patient, this is A. Patient C has got this tooth wear as well, so they've got a reduced clinical crown height. But what happens in patient C is instead of the teeth remaining in the same place, patient C, their teeth will over erupt. So if you look at the distance between patient C and patient A, the distance is the same. Because the teeth have over erupted, there's no change in the freeway space. Because there's no change in the freeway space, when they bite together, they're closing exactly the same as patient A did. So there's also no change in OVD. So patient A, normal, 
normal OVD. Patient B, where? Increase in freeway space because nothing's changed. Overclosing, reduction in OVD. Patient C, where? But over eruption, no change in freeway space, no change in OVD. Why it becomes, just gonna chuck another term in. In patient C, the fact that these over erupt, that's something called dental alveolar compensation. So patient C, where dental alveolar compensation where they over erupt, no change in freeway space, no change in OVD. Why this is important is because when you're restoring the patient, you have to think about, you know, things are gonna change, you're building things up, you have to think about tolerance. If you ask yourself, is patient B or patient C, if you were to build up teeth, which patient's gonna tolerate that better? Will it be B, who has more space, or will it be C, who has less space? And I'm hoping you said B in your head. Basically, if you imagine you've got this, this freeway space, and you were to put a crown on top of this, these two opposing teeth, and you built it up like that, look, freeway space goes back to normal, OVD goes back to normal, but jaws remain in the same place. If you have patient B, uh, patient C, who's got the dental alveolar compensation, so they've got over eruption of the teeth, and you put a crown on this, the position of the jaw is gonna open. So their OVD is gonna increase from what, from before, their, okay, let me try and explain this. Their OVD in patient C, is gonna increase beyond what their OVD has ever been. Whereas patient B, who had the reduced OVD, because you've got that space, you can restore back to their original OVD much more comfortably, if that makes sense. So patient B, who's got the increase in freeway space, plenty of room to restore into, but because patient C's had over eruption, you'd have to open the jaw up beyond what they're used to to restore the dentition, so it's sometimes not as well tolerated, okay? Last but not least for tooth wear, let's look at a general kind of um, treatment plan. So it's gonna follow your bread and butter template, emergency prevention, restorative, um, recall. So last but not least for tooth wear, we're gonna just quickly go over a general treatment plan. It's gonna follow your bread and butter treatment plan template that's, that's with any case. So your emergency prevention, restorative and recall. Emergency we know are things like getting the patient out of pain. Commonly in, in tooth wear it's dentine hypersensitivity. So we've got to consider things like fluoride varnish, desensitizing pastes and, and Durafat. Prevention phase, exactly the same as everything else. Identify the etiology and manage the etiology. So this is gonna include things like Oral hygiene instruction on how to brush using an electric brush if there's abrasion. Um, diet advice. Obviously, if you're doing your Viva, mention the Delivering Better Oral Health Toolkit and quote some quote some figures from there. If you've got a bruxist, you can prescribe something like a splint. You want to consider what type of splint. Is it going to be soft acrylic, hard acrylic, bilamina, or a Michigan splint, um, which is kind of which is kind of the right for the patient. Do you suspect there's any internal um, internal acids causing erosion? Do you want to perhaps liaise with or refer to the GP? You can think about um, PPIs for, for reflux, um, managing um, excessive alcohol intake, or um, things like if you're suspected of bulimia and things like that, but obviously be, be very sensitive to the patient. And then in terms of restorative, just gonna kind of address some of the basic concepts. So we can have obviously, you know, we mentioned expectations before. Does the patient just want to accept a monitor? If they do, that's absolutely fine. But every single checkup, make sure you readdress it because they might change their mind or you might be able to explain it, I don't know, a little bit better the second time. If we do look at treatment, then how are we gonna rebuild the dentition? Um, Typically, in the most basic understanding, you rebuild the anteriors and then address the posteriors. Um, the anteriors to kind of get the right dimensions and then the posteriors according to that. So you've got a couple of options for this. The first thing is the Dahl principle. 
which to simplify it essentially means that you build teeth out of occlusion and the remaining teeth will then over erupt into occlusion. So in a wear case, for example, you can build up three to three so that when you bite together, those teeth are out of those teeth are in super occlusion and the posterior teeth don't contact. What will happen over the next few weeks and months is those posterior teeth should over erupt into occlusion. So by building these up and having the posterior teeth over erupt, what you've essentially done, instead of restoring the back teeth, is you've restored the OVD or built the OVD up by using dental alveolar compensation and, and over, over eruption. If you don't want to wait that long or you don't think the dial principle is going to work, then of course you can build the anterior teeth up and you can also build the posterior teeth up with, with direct and, and indirect restorations. Finally, recall as always, nice guidelines for um, recall intervals, FGDP for, for bite wings. Um, even though you might not think they're relevant, make sure you mention everything um, because you want to show the examiner that you've thought about everything comprehensively. So let's move swiftly on to section number two, which will be talking all things fixed pros, which essentially your inlays, onlays, crowns, and we'll also touch briefly on um, bridges as well. So before we get into things, I just wanted to clarify basically the types of um, kind of indirect restorations that you have for a single tooth. So basically an indirect restoration is something that's fabricated in the lab to replace tooth tissue that is essentially adhered or cemented onto a tooth. So we've got three main types of indirect restoration um, for a single tooth. Uh, the reason I'm saying single tooth is because I'll be referring to bridges later. But these are inlays, onlays and, and crowns. And the main difference between the three is the, basically the amount of tooth tissue that they, they replace. Inlays basically do what they say in the tin. They provide no cuspal coverage and they replace tooth tissue within the confines of the crown itself, the crown of the tooth that is, um, without extending onto the cusps. Onlays do provide cuspal coverage, but they kind of act as a, um, a cap for the tooth. So instead of extending the whole material around all the surfaces of the tooth, they typically just sit on the occlusal surface of the tooth and perhaps slightly down onto the axial walls of the tooth as well. So they're much more um, conservative of tooth tissue than, than a crown, um, but typically a lot less retentive um, from the prep itself. Whereas a crown is essentially, you can imagine it as like a beanie, and it will cover the whole surface of the tooth. It'll cover the occlusal surface and also the axial walls of that tooth as well. The prep for a crown compared to an onlay and an inlay is obviously a lot heavier. You take away a lot more of the tooth structure, but what you get at the end is typically a more retentive um, and a stronger restoration as well. So throughout this kind of this section of the presentation, I'll typically be everything will be situated towards um, a crown. Uh, so indications for a crown, like you can see here. Um, and things like that, but a lot of it overlaps with onlays as well. Inlays we don't really need to consider too much for, for our viva. Um, so yeah, crowns, a little bit of onlays as well. So if we start with the indication of crowns, in a nutshell, essentially what they're there for is they're to reinforce a tooth that has lost quite a significant amount of structure or has been significantly weakened in, in, um, in some respect. So you can see that there are four on here, and these are typically the four most common ones. You've got heavily broken down teeth, um, typically where you've lost a marginal ridge or you've got two surfaces. Um, then a crown can be indicated if you, if you think a, a direct restoration won't be strong enough. Cracks and fractures. The gold standard for treating a, um, a crack or a fracture where the tooth is restorable is cuspal coverage. So this is in the form of an, an onlay or a, a crown itself. Post RCT in, in molar teeth or, or in posterior teeth, um, we've, known, we've known since the 80s that if you do endo on a posterior tooth, then it becomes more brittle. And without cuspal coverage, that tooth is six times more likely to fracture. This doesn't apply for anterior teeth. Anterior teeth, you can get away with a direct restoration if you have enough tooth tissue for that. But posterior teeth, premolars and molars, your gold standard following endodontics is to crown it. Finally, tooth surface loss. Tooth surface loss, again, it's another kind of um, 
another kind of pathology that, that causes significant um, tooth tissue loss. So crowning, onlays, again, is a, is a really a restorative option depending on um, how much tooth tissue you've got left. I haven't put it on here, but you can also consider um, poor aesthetics, so in the, in the anterior region. But again, this is if you've exhausted all of your more minimal um, techniques like, like composite bonding, um, composite veneers or, or porcelain veneers as well. So I'm not going to dwell on this slide. Um, like I said earlier, these types of things are going to be repeated throughout and they're repeated throughout my videos. Whenever you're looking to um, restore or treat a tooth, you always have to determine the restorability, understand the patient expectations, do an oral hygiene assessment as well. And it, it's no different when you're planning for, for crowns. I'm going to go into a little bit more of the specifics of um, the respect, with respect to the tooth tissue and the tooth you have left in, in later slides. But again, in this circle, very similar to what we've spoken about before. The Darwood Dental Practicality Index is there again just to reinforce the fact we need to look at periodontal, endodontic and um, tooth tissue from a restorability aspect. So like I said before, if you haven't seen episode two with, with special investigations and treatment planning, check that out to understand this in a, in a little bit more detail. That being said though, we do need to discuss tooth tissue um, considerations when we're talking about fixed pros or indirect restorations because the, the factors on the next few pages are going to basically he help determine the, the outcome of, and success and the restorability from a tooth tissue perspective. So the first thing we need to address is the for all, which is this kind of this magic word that you hear loads about at university that may or may not be um, very well explained or very well understood. But having a for all is key to the success of, of a crown. And essentially, the definition of a for all is when you look at the inside of a crown, you'll see that there's 360 degrees of metal or ceramic. You want this 360 degrees to sit on sound tooth and two millimeters of dentine that's sticking up, sticking up axially. So if you look at the image on the left-hand side, the difference between the two is where those green arrows are pointing in, the two millimeters of dentine that's just sticking upwards. What this little dentine will do is on lateral excursion, when you're chewing, that'll prevent the crown or the root from fracturing in a lateral direction. If you look at the image on the left, the one with the red arrows, you can see that if you can imagine that's lateral excursion, the post that's in there is moving because that dentine is not there to resist movement on lateral excursion. So it's kind of a preventive, pre uh, preventive or protective feature um, to help during, during function. If you look at the images on the right hand side, the top image without the rubber dam, that's, that's a tooth that's very likely going to fail. You can see that it's a flat root and it just sh shouldn't have been restored directly like this. If you'd imagine how easy it is to snap that because it's literally just glued on top. However, if you look at the, the image at the bottom in the rubber dam, you can see that there's a little bit of tooth tissue sticking up. So when, the, when they've built up the core um, on this and crown prepped it, you've retained that tooth tissue. Now, if you imagine that you sit a crown over the top of that, every time you try to push sideways, that little bit of dentine is going to resist, resist those movements. There's an analogy that I've used to, to quite a few people on Instagram who have asked me about the for all. And essentially what I say is, is if you imagine that you're stood in a field on, on solid mud, okay, and your ankles are tied together, and this is the top image, and you go and stand there with your feet together, tied together. And someone comes and tries to push you over by the shoulders, chances are you're going to push over quite easily. And that's, that pushing force is essentially mimicking lateral excursion. Now, if you imagine you're in the same field, okay, your feet are tied together, but instead of being stood on solid mud, you're up to your, up to your knees in, in sticky mud. If that same person came and tried to push you over again, it would be a lot more difficult to get you from a standing position to a fallen over position. And essentially what the fact that your feet are in the mud, that's essentially mimicking the for all, which is something at the bottom of that restoration preventing lateral forces from, from knocking it sideways. Um, so that's kind of the, the simplest way I can put it. It's a two millimeter ring of dentine all the way around the tooth on a crown prep that your crown sits on and it prevents failure on, on lateral movements.
So when we're looking at restorability for crowns, we also have to really look at the tooth tissue in depth. Because although things like heavily broken down teeth, um, cracks and fractures, uh, and tooth wear and things like that are indications for crowns, not every single case that has this is going to be suitable for a crown. They have to meet certain um, kind of criteria and rules to ensure that the tooth actually is restorable. So if we look at tooth tissue from respect of, of a crown prep, and I, spoke, I touched upon this earlier, you need to have a certain minimum clinical crown height to be able to get that retention form when you're sitting your crown on top of it. So the kind of the, the golden numbers that we aim for in posterior teeth is you need to have three millimeters of height from the gingival margin to, to you know, the top of the tooth. And you also need to have four millimeters in the anterior region. And like I said, that will get you your resistance form and your retention when that crown is sitting on top of it. If you don't have that clinical crown height, then you need to think, well, do I need to build this tooth up with, with some composite or another restorative material to get that height? Or do I need to consider crown lengthening and surgery to get the height that way as well? If you don't have that height, that minimum height, the likelihood is that that restoration is much more likely to fail, much more likely not to have the retention that you need for good, um, good longevity. Another thing we need to consider is, well, where do the margins actually sit? If the margins are super gingival, then that's great. We can play with them. We can take them you know, to the gingival margin if we're in the aesthetic zone. We can keep more tooth tissue if we're in the in the um, in posterior teeth. Uh, we've got a lot more more flexibility. But if your margins are subgingival, then we're kind of moving into more of a, a difficult or awkward um, situation. Essentially, it's it's kind of understood that it's acceptable to do a subgingival prep up to about 0.5 millimeters below the gingival margin. Anything else like anything other than that or a bit bigger than that, you're at risk of, you know, poor marginal fit when you're cementing the crown. If you have a poor marginal fit, then the cement is much more likely to fail. Bacteria can ingress and cause caries and, and periodontal disease and things like that. Not only that, if you have sub subgingival margins, you're much more likely to be encroaching on something called, called the biological width, which is another one of these terms that's chucked around at university. In terms of the viva, it is very unlikely to come up, but it's good to have a kind of an understanding in the back of your head. Um, and essentially what it is, is it's the distance from the gingival sulcus to the tip of the alveolar crest bone. And you want to make sure that you've got at least three millimeter clearance from this biological width from your crown margins. Because if you encroach on it, studies suggest that you're much more likely to have um, periodontal inflammation, attachment loss and bone loss so you might have you know beautiful beautiful margins and a, and a great looking crown but if you're encroaching on this biological width then it's a recipe for disaster in terms of the periodontal aspect of of that tooth so have a quick understanding of that don't need to know it inside out and it's very unlikely to come up but something that probably will will come up which or which can come up are cracks and fractures um very difficult to manage, but there's a, there's a kind of a basic concept that you can understand when you're, you're looking at cracks in terms of restorability. So if a crack is super gingival, typically that tooth can be saved. You might need to address the pulp, but a super gingival crack is, is great. If the crack extends subgingivally, typically it's game over. What will happen is bacteria will get into that crack from from uh, from the gingiva cause a whole host of, of pulpal problems and also typically if you have a crack that goes subgingival it will cause an isolated deep pocket next to that tooth and if that forms then the tooth is unrestorable if you have a crack that is super gingival but you take away a restoration or some tooth tissue and you see that that crack extends onto the pulp floor or into an orifice again that tooth is that tooth is unrestorable so with cracks, be very cautious. Super gingival is good. Subgingival with a perio pocket is really bad. Onto the pulp roof, uh, onto the pulp floor or canal orifice is also unrestorable as well. So this slide is not super important, and essentially it outlines the principles of a crown prep that you're um, you basically need to get 
when you're preparing for a crown. So it's unlikely you'll get asked things like this, but again, it's good, uh, good extra knowledge and, and good to be aware of. So it outlines things like retention and resistance, which we touched upon earlier. Retention is no movement along the path of insertion. So if you see a crown like that, no movement away from the way you seated it. And resistance essentially is no movement in any direction during, during function. The way that you can get this is, like we spoke about, you need to ensure you've got a minimum clinical crown height for the posterior anterior region. A six degree taper between the axial walls is something you want to aim for. Anything, you know, more slanted like that, it's not going to sit on. Anything like that, the undercuts mean the crown is less likely to go on or off. And using the correct cement and the correct bonding technique as, as well is obviously, obviously critical. In terms of the functional cusp, essentially what it is, is it's a thicker bit of material on the cusp that is likely to take heavy occlusal forces on, um, on excursion. The way that I remember it is I draw it, literally draw it, and it's kind of like a mouth. So you have a P on the top, these are the teeth, and a B on the bottom, and these are the teeth. And that means that on a maxillary tooth, a functional cusp is palatal, and on a mandibular tooth, it's, it's buccal, P and B. Finally, finishing lines. Different materials for crowns are going to have different finishing lines, so, so be considerate of those as well. This slide is exactly the same, not super important. Um, and it basically just outlines the thicknesses that you need to reduce for, for posterior teeth. Every single resource you look at differs slightly, but these are basically kind of, you know, general ones that you need to be thinking about for, for different materials. So we've touched upon assessment. We've touched upon the principles of crown prep. So what actually happens once you prep that tooth? Well, we, need to, we now need to move on to the impression stage. The impression stage for a crown prep is really important because the technician needs to see that tooth on the cast in really high detail. They need to be able to see the margins, undercuts, and super high, super high detail to get a really accurately made crown. So when we're taking impressions for a crown prep, we typically avoid alginate and we use silicone. Alginate, whilst it has, has amazing properties um, for some impressions, in terms of a crown prep, it just doesn't get it in as high enough detail as possible. It's not very dimensionally stable, so it needs to be cast straight away. And it's quite prone to distortion as well, which can make the, the cast quite inaccurate. So what we tend to use is we use an addition or a condensation silicone. These are brilliant because they've got great handling properties. They capture really, really fine details, okay? And they're very dimensionally stable, so you can, you can transport them to the lab and they don't have to be cast as quickly as, as, um, as an alginate impression does. The technique is, is quite simple. When you have these silicones, they come essentially in, in normally in four different consistencies. You've got a, a wash, a light body, medium body, heavy body, and a putty, which is actually five, not four. And you use either one or two of these consistencies together in certain, um, certain techniques. So you've got a monophase, which is where you use just a single um, viscosity and take an impression. Whilst that's good in terms of handling and things like that, it's not the best for capturing you know, the highest details. When you're capturing a crown prep, you need a, a wash or a light body to really get into those undercuts and and around those margins. So the kind of things you do is you'll use either a single stage dual phase or a two stage dual phase impression technique. And what this means is you're using two viscosities, you're using an impression tray with heavy body or putty in, which is which will act as your kind of your base to take the whole arch, and you'll syringe around the tooth, a wash or a light body. The difference between the two is in a single stage dual phase, you syringe the light body around the tooth and you seat the impression at the same time they'll set together and because they're the same material they'll chemically bond together this can be a little bit challenging because you need to coordinate with your nurse but more often than not you get a really nice impression a two-stage dual phase is essentially where you have a putty you take an impression and then you let that impression set syringe light body around and then you reseat it the benefit again is the you know less kind of um, crossover with your nurse, but it does take a little bit longer. And sometimes when you reseat that impression, you might not might not see it in the right time. There's no right or wrong answer. Both techniques are viable, and often it depends on the clinical case that you're that you're treating.
So we've done a beautiful crown prep. We've taken a great impression. We've sent it to the lab and they've sent back this fantastic crown. This is where the fun begins and you actually get to see the fruits of your labor and cement that crown on. And I'm going to flex a little bit because the crown in the image is, is a crown that I did this year and probably one of my favorite bits of work to date purely because I just love the shade match. Um, and whilst the lab has to take so much credit for that, I think a lot of what I did with that patient to prepare also led us to this result. Um, I was meticulous with this patient. I got a real thorough shade match with them in the mirror. I took clinical photos of the teeth before so that the lab could see exactly what the shades of the teeth were either side. And I drew them a really nice little diagram to say, you know, I wanted more translucency at the incisor ledge, like you can see. I wanted it more yellow at the cervical margin. And those little attentions to detail got a really nice outcome. Um, the crown is the upper right too, which you probably guessed. Um, but it blends really nicely with the upper left one, the upper upper right three, um, the upper right one as well. Unfortunately, the patient still got this um, this kind of this white composite on the distal incisor ledge of the of the upper right one. But hopefully, we'll be changing that at some point in the future to make it make it all match nicely. But that's a bit of a tangent, um, and I kind of lost my trail of thought on this slide. But essentially, it's just to talk you through the things that happen at a crown fit. To make it go smoothly probably won't come up in your viva but good information nonetheless so the first thing that you want to do is you'll get that little stone die and you want to get that crown you just want to see it on that die you want to check is it seating properly are the margins all right and then get the opposing cast and put it into occlusion if you can and check the occlusion truth to be told is if there's an issue on this die the likelihood is, is there's going to be an issue in the mouth so you want to kind of preempt anything from happening and check the lab have made it to to your specification once you've got the patient in the chair you can do exactly the same thing check it in the mouth does it seat well are there great margins does the patient bite together properly if the occlusion is slightly off you can adjust that later if if uh, if indicated and importantly as well check the aesthetics get them to hold a mirror Show them that crown in the mouth and say, are you happy? Tell them that once you've cemented it on, it's very difficult to get that off. So they need to be 100% sure that they're happy with that crown. When we look at the margins, we need to look at the integrity of that margin, which is so, so important to the outcome of the success. If you have a margin that is slightly off and, and can't be adjusted or corrected, then the likelihood is, is that water, saliva, bacteria... Is going to get underneath there and, and there's a risk of decay, the cement um, degrading and that crown failing altogether. So you can see on the bottom right we've got a few scenarios of what can happen with the margins and essentially if it's overextended or over contoured like A and C you just polish those if you can and make it a nice fit. If you have a crown that is underextended or there is an open margin essentially it's game over that crown needs to be remade. Okay. Once you've done that, prepare your crown for, for cementation, which we'll, we'll show on the next couple of slides. Cement it, seat it fully, clear the excess from the margins, floss the interproximal regions, get the patient to bite down hard, check it's all fitting nicely, check the occlusion, send them away nice and happy. These next two slides I'm just going to leave on for a little bit. Um, I'm not going to talk through it, but it basically talks about materials you can use for indirect restorations, pros and cons, very self-explanatory, and also different cements you can use and how you can prepare different, different materials for cements as well. So pause them if you want, very self-explanatory, uh, and have a good look at those. Sometimes a patient may come in with a tooth like this image here and you might think, shit, is that tooth actually restorable? Um, or are we going to have to you know, extract the root and, and consider something else? And luckily some techniques have been developed where you can reinforce a tooth with restorative material, be it directly or indirectly, and use that as the base for your, um, for your crown itself. When we're considering treatment planning, we still have to think about for both the techniques, this slide and the next slide, we still have to think about the ferrule being present. So we need two millimeters of dentine. And you can see on this image here, you've got dentine sticking up super gingerly. 
And the crown margin, so the, where it cements and seats, must finish on sound tooth and not restorative material as well. So the first one that we can consider is something called a post-core crown. And essentially this is used in single-rooted teeth, so anterior teeth, upper fives, lower fours and fives. And what it is, is in a root canal treated tooth, so if you have a tooth like this and you're considering a post crown, you have to do endo first. In a root canal treated tooth, you remove some of the GP, you prepare the canal, so you open the space up a little bit. And in that space, we'll either go a prefabricated post that you can build a core up and then do a crown prep on, or the lab will have made you a post and a core that you cement in and then you stick your crown on top of that. It's great for use in, in, in teeth, um, and it really does reinforce them. The reason that it can only be typically be used on single rooted teeth is that you, if you imagine, for example, this pen is an anterior tooth. If the crown is here, the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? The line between the crown and the root canal, you know, it's often, often in line. If you have a multi-rooted tooth, it comes off at an angle like that with the crowns up here. So you're much more likely to perforate at the fication or, or um, laterally. And also the root is much more at risk of fracture. So you typically do it in, in single rooted teeth with you know extensive tooth tissue loss. I briefly touched upon the types um, just now, but I'll, I'll go through them again. So the first one you can have is a prefabricated post. And essentially what this is, is a one size fits all post that you'll insert into the root. And on top of it, there'll be a little um, a kind of a retentive feature. You'll build composite around that and then you'll crown prep it, take an impression, and your crown will go on top of that. The beauty of that is a lot of it you can do chair side. And it means there's, you know, there's less for the lab to do and less things that are likely to go wrong. And you've also got enough that you can put a temporary crown on in the meantime as well. The other thing that you can do is something called a, um, a cast alloy post and core. So this is essentially where you prepare the canal and then one, more, one way or another, so either an indirect or a direct, but I'm not gonna, not gonna get too much into that. The lab will then take the impression that you've got and they'll create a metal post with a metal core on top. You cement that into the root and then you cement your crown on top of that. Another really good tactic, another really good technique um, but it's very dependent on you getting the lab an accurate, um, you know, accurate impression of that canal prep itself. For root treated and heavily broken down um, posterior teeth that have multiple roots where a post isn't viable, we have an option to do something called a NIAR core. And essentially what it is, is you remove three to four millimeters of GP in the root canals, you pack in your amalgam or composite, whichever material you choose, use that as kind of similarly to a post to reinforce it and then you build up the tooth tissue that's been lost crown prep it and you use that as your as your core it's a nice technique to do because it's it's quite straightforward and quick compared to preparing for a post gets you really good retention and reinforcement especially going into the root canals um, and it can save teeth that that might otherwise be unrestorable it's very similar to post and core that you you know you follow the same principles for restorability. So a ferrule needs to be present, and um, the crown margins need to finish on a natural tooth. So let's quickly touch upon bridges. Uh, I get a lot of people on Instagram who message me and quite confused about the terminology. So let's quickly go through you know what different types of bridges are and, and the advantages and disadvantages of each as well. So on the screen here we've got four bridges um, which are you know very similar, and I think that. The reason it gets confusing is because there are different terms for the same bridge and there are also terms that are used interchangeably. So you might hear different on, you know, videos, lecturers might say different things, the literature might say different things. So I'm just going to try and quickly, quickly clarify, you know, what types of bridges we've got. And in a nutshell, there are pretty much two main types. You've got your Maryland or resin bonded bridge, which you have, uh, a wing of ceramic or metal that bonds to the back surface of a tooth with a pontic sticking off of it into, um, into an edentulous space. Or you have your conventional or fixed bridge, which essentially you have a crown prep tooth. You see a crown on that tooth and then there's a pontic in the edentulous space sticking off of that. 
The reason that people get confused is because the word cantilever gets chucked in quite a lot. And people often think of cantilever purely as a term for a fixed bridge. Whereas essentially what the word cantilever means is it means joined to one side. So cantilever can be used for both Maryland or fixed bridges. And essentially it means that there's one abutment tooth that the pontic is sticking off of. So if you look at the image on the top right, this is a Maryland bridge because it's resin bonded. It has the wing that goes on the back of the tooth, but it's a cantilever Maryland bridge because it's only bonding to one abutment tooth. If you look on the bottom right, you can see that that tooth is crown prepped. So that is a fixed or a conventional bridge, but it's a cantilever fixed bridge because it's only one abutment tooth. If that was like the image on the bottom left, you can see there's two crown preps. That is simply a conventional or a fixed fixed bridge. The word cantilever goes nowhere near that because cantilever means bonded or joined onto one thing. So hopefully that clears that up. The differences between the two essentially are that a Maryland or resin bonded bridge is very minimal. You don't really do any prep, you just cement it to the tooth. So it is minimally invasive. Um, you do need to prep the tooth, you know, acid etch and things like that. But as a whole, very minimally invasive. As a result, it's not the strongest restoration. So it's typically for low stress areas and anterior areas as well, because you can get a really nice aesthetic result without taking, taking away too much tooth. Um, but it's not good with heavy occlusal forces. A fixed bridge or a conventional bridge is good with those heavy occlusal forces because your abutment tooth is literally a crown sat on top of a tooth. So it's got really good retention, really good resistance form, and it can take those heavy, um, take those heavy occlusal forces quite well. The drawback of a conventional or a fixed bridge is the fact that you have to prepare a tooth next door. That puts the risk of, um, that puts the nerve at risk of devitalization because any tooth you crown prep, you know, one in one in 10 over about 10 years, we de will devitalize. So if you are going to do a conventional or fixed bridge, you need to make the patient aware of this during your um, risks and benefits um, conversation. Last but not least, we've got the final section, which is removable bros. And in this section, we're going to be covering all things, all things dentures. So first, I guess, let's just chat about the, the types of dentures that you can see on the screen now and the kind of things you need to be aware of for, um, for your vivas. So top left, your bread and butter dentures. These are your, you know, your regular dentures, partial or complete dentures and acrylic or cobalt chrome dentures your everyday dentures, your definitive dentures. Top right, we've got immediate dentures, and these essentially are dentures that are made to replace teeth that have been extracted at that appointment or are to be extracted. Um, these are with the benefit of, you know, you've got immediate replacement of teeth that are lost, so, so good for the anterior region. But long-term, we know that obviously there's gonna be gum and bone subsidence, so, so long-term, they're not really your definitive option. They're more of an interim so that you don't um, don't lose the aesthetics following from, from an extraction. Over dentures, bottom left, these are ones that essentially sit on, on retained roots. Um, retained roots are kind of used as abutments and, and support in the area. Um, the benefit of leaving retained roots in situ is obviously, if you take a tooth out, the bone will resorb. If you leave the root in situ, you'll, you'll retain that bone height. So perhaps you'll have a larger, um, higher alveolar ridge. Some patients, obviously, you have to avoid extractions. So for example, if a patient's taking alandronic acid, so you might consider leaving a root in situ and, and doing an overdenture on that instead. And finally, bottom right, something to be made aware of. Some patients can have um, implant-supported dentures where titanium implants are, are placed in the jaw and the dentures fixed to those so they're kind of a fixed removable option um, per se the risks and well the benefits of dentures and then the risks of dentures they're quite straightforward the benefits of dentures you know it's replacing any missed teeth it's good for aesthetics you're replacing edentulous spaces you can change the facial profile and and restore the facial profile back to what it once was it will help with mastication so chewing and function and it will also help with the patient speaking Often if a patient doesn't have any teeth or is lacking teeth, they might have a lisp. Um, 
it will protect the existing dentition. So if you have, you know, spaces, teeth will be taking a heavier bite than, than if there were teeth either side. So replacing those with, um, with false teeth, you know, you can spread the forces of occlusion to protect those teeth. Um, yeah, so the benefits are, are both psychological and, and physiological. In terms of risks, it's quite straightforward. A denture is a plaque trap. It's an area that bacteria absolutely love to live on, stick to, and breed on. So this bacteria, food can get stuck there. It can increase the risk of decay uh, and increase the risk of, of gum disease and fungal diseases as well. It can also cause trauma. So friction between the denture and, and the teeth and friction between the denture and the mucosa as well can cause things like ulcerations, denture granulomas, sores, and, and things like that. So we're back here. We're back at the good old pre-treatment assessment um, page, which you've seen so many times already. And a lot of the things that you've seen are going to be relatable to, to denture assessment as well. Things like what are the patient's expectations? What's the prognosis of the teeth? What's the the occlusal scheme like, um, things like that. Specifics to look out for in a pre-denture assessment are things like, has the patient had dentures before? What type of dentures? Did they tolerate them well? Did they cause any soreness? Did they wear them? Did they like the shade, the look, the appearance? Did they have any challenging, challenging anatomy? As much information as you can get on a patient's previous dentures, you can use and then work with the patient's current expectations to try and make something that is that is suitable for them. You've also got to consider the patient's medical history. There are factors in the medical history that can um, impact your design and things like this. Um, so things like, you know, does the patient have xerostomia? If you have a complete upper denture, you're going to be able to get a good um, suction and peripheral, st peripheral seal if they've got a dry mouth, or you're going to have to tell them, you know, look, you're going to have to rely quite a bit on, um, on denture adhesive to keep those up. Does the patient have immunosuppressant? immunosuppression? So, for example, are they more at risk of, of things like fungal infections? These are all things that you need to consider, um, consider beforehand. When you do an assessment of the mouth and the patient's oral cavity, you need to look at the mouth and you also need to look at the teeth individually. The teeth individually is, is restorability, the prognosis. You're not going to put dentures in with teeth with poor or or hopeless prognosis, you're going to want to get those out first and have that discussion with a patient. But when it comes to the mouth, you need to look at a few things that perhaps you might not have looked at before, um, thinking about the things we've spoken about already. So these are things like challenging anatomy. So does the patient have any bony tori? Do they have a high palatal vault? Do they have high frenal attachments? Shallow sulci where you can't get much... Um, depth of the flanges, so perhaps not, not too good retention or stability. What's the shape of their ridge? What's the shape of their arch? You know, what's the shape of their dentition? Are their teeth crowded? You know, are they nice and straight? Have they got a lot of space between the teeth? Not a lot of space between the teeth to work with? Have you got uh, things like undercuts that you can work with to get some retention, especially if you're thinking about using clasps? Has the patient got a gag reflex? If you're thinking about an acrylic denture, perhaps you don't want to extend it too far back because the patient's going to gag. Um, you've got to look at things like the lip line. Has the patient got a high or low lip line? Perhaps if they've got a low lip line, you can mask you know, more a more shallow flange if, if there's going to be trauma in the area. And things like that. There's a lot to consider, and I know I've just, just kind of gone through them quickly. Um... But in your exam, if you can throw those things out as considerations, then um, you're going to get good points for those. That's about it for pre-denture assessment. Um, yeah, so just remember, what's their expectations? Think about the patient as a whole first, then look at the mouth, then look at the teeth individually, including the occlusion as well. So these are two things that, well, I didn't touch upon Kennedy classification, but I'll, I'll mention that briefly in a second. I just mentioned ridge classification and ridge assessment on the on the slide before, and I just wanted to touch upon it again because this is kind of moving into distinction level answers, is having a good understanding of what this is and, and why it impacts um, denture assessment and, and denture planning moving forwards. So this is the Carwood and, and Howell ridge classification system. And essentially, when a patient loses teeth, 
over the first year, you're going to have the most bone resorption and the, the shape of a patient's ridge is going to change. And it's going to be, you know, dependent on so many, so many factors. It's going to change from patient to patient. It's going to be dependent on when the tooth came out, how many teeth came out and things like that. This is especially important in patients with, you know, large saddle areas or, you know, completely edentate arches where you need to sit a large saddle region on an, on an alveolar ridge. So if you look at the image that's on the right hand side, it basically shows you a cross section of the ridge and the kind of the different shapes that you can get. The shapes towards the left hand side, those are your favorable shapes. Those are your shapes where, you know, the ridge is quite high, the ridge is quite smooth and, and, and rounded. So in these kinds of types of cases, you'll get you know, nice flange extension into the sulcus, you'll get a higher area of support for the saddle area to sit on. So ultimately it'll be more retentive, more stable and more comfortable for the patient. As you move towards the right of that image, you can see that the ridge is, you know, it's resorbing quite considerably. You can see that you've got more of a triangular or knife shaped ridge. And these are the patients where you really have to lay your expectations out from the start. If you know that a patient has got this knife or, or sharp edged ridge, you know at the end of the day that the retention and the stability is not going to be as good. They might rely on fixative. And the pressure from the saddle pushing down on that is going to be a little bit more uncomfortable than someone who's got a round ridge. So if you can understand that from the off, outline that to your patient and manage their expectations, then you're already onto a winner when you're, when you're making dentures. The Kennedy classification, which is the bit on the left, you have to, you want to do this and you want to know this for every single patient. It's very common in a viva to get a removable pros case and you know, you'll see occlusal photos of teeth and they will say to you, please provide the Kennedy classification. So make sure you know this. The way that you calculate it is you always work for the most posterior site. Um, and you don't include seven and eights unless they're being replaced. So have a good understanding of this. This will help with, with treatment planning moving forward as well. Um, but really simple marks to pick up on in a, in a viva. This slide is essentially just some, some landmarks to consider in an edentulous case. You probably won't get given a picture of, of two models and have to identify things. But even so, moving forward, these are, you know, it's good to understand where the different landmarks are. Um, inside the oral cavity. The last thing I want to touch upon on the pre-denture assessment is when you're planning dentures, it's important to know the prognosis of a tooth. With poor and hopeless prognosis, you want to be having a conversation with a patient, you know, do we take it out before or do we, you know, make the dentures but with the understanding that these teeth are probably going to have to come out at some point soon in the future. If you have teeth left in that you know aren't of good prognosis, then you need to design your denture accordingly. You need to either use acrylic, which you can add teeth on quite easily, so you can have like kind of a transitional denture, or you need to design your cobalt chrome in a way that it'll accommodate for teeth with poor prognosis. So for example, on the, on the screen now, you can see a post from Finley Sutton on Instagram, who's a huge, um, huge figure in the, in the removable pros world got a really good Instagram which I've linked and a really good YouTube channel as well um, which is you know it's amazing for for our learning and you can see that the patient on the left he's designed this chrome denture in, in a minimal way because the patient has theoretically good prognosis teeth if the if the denture on the left was designed for a patient with poor prognosis teeth it's not very easy to add metal framework onto cobalt chrome so if any of those teeth in the, you know, in the premolar region needed extraction, that denture on the left hand side isn't suitable for that kind of patient. The denture on the right hand side shows an alternative design for someone who has teeth of poor prognosis that are likely going to have to come out in the near future. So what he's done is he's extended the metal framework around the palatal region of those teeth. So should any of those need to come out, it's easy to add those teeth onto the denture as opposed to if you have the design on the left. So now we've done our assessment, we need to look at dentures design and we need to be familiar for our exams with three key terms that basically make, if you can nail these, then a denture will be comfortable, wearable and, and functional. The first one is retention. Retention essentially is no movement when the patient is at rest 
back out along the path of insertion. So if you imagine you stick a denture to the roof of the mouth or, or in between teeth, retention means that at rest, if the patient's just sat there, it won't then drop out along that path of, path of insertion. There's lots of ways to be able to, to get this retention. Some are general to both the upper and lower dentures and some are specific to one or the other. The first and probably one of the best mechanisms of retention, which is in, is in partial dentures, are clasps and precision attachments. Clasps are, are great. They can be used in both cobalt chrome and uh, acrylic dentures. And essentially what they do is if you imagine the tooth is here, this is the top of the crown, this is a little undercut here. What they'll do, depending on the design of the clasp, is they will engage that undercut and they will grip on. So any resistance is essentially prevented by that gripping on like a little arm around that tooth. There's something called indirect retention, which is kind of a little bit complicated, but essentially what it means is when, you, when the denture is at rest, there'll be resistance to movement around a fulcrum or a focal point. And all you need to understand is basically you position your, um, your rest seats, saddles, major minor connectors in certain positions to prevent movement around a single point in the mouth. Guide planes and frictions are good at uh, um, aiding retention in uh, partial, partial denture cases. Essentially what it means is it's the friction between acrylic and, and real teeth preventing it from moving. Well extended flanges within the neutral zone. This is both for partial and um, complete dentures. The neutral zone essentially is, an e is a zone of equilibrium in between two forces. So if you imagine on one side you've got you know, forces from the lip pushing inwards, and on the other side you've got forces from the tongue pushing, pushing outwards, that denture should sit in the zone equal between those two that neither one or the other is stronger and is able to move that denture. Peripheral seal is something that is only seen in, um, in complete dentures. And essentially what it means is it's when you have saliva between the acrylic of an upper complete denture and the palate area, when you push that up, it creates kind of a suction. And it's dependent on having acrylic that is well extended towards the, um, the border between the hard and soft palate, an area called the post dam. And you push up there and that saliva sucking that in along with things like well extended flanges should keep that denture in place um, as best as possible. But obviously, like I said earlier, with, with a patient with xeristomia, you might not be able to effectively um, gain a peripheral seal. Finally, and this only applies to, to mandibular dentures, of course, because, you know, you're, you're fighting against gravity in a maxillary denture. Gravity down here. Pulling that denture down will keep it from going essentially out of that path of insertion upwards, so it will be a, a retentive factor. So the next consideration is support, and support is essentially the opposite to retention. It's no movement towards the, the denture bearing area at rest. Um, when you have movement towards that area, it can cause you know trauma, soreness, and, and things like that. So there are three main types of, of support. First one is tooth borne, so this is by rest seats or you can have an overdenture um, where it sits on the tooth or part of the tooth. You can have mucosa borne where the saddles or part of the denture or the acrylic sits on the mucosa. When you have this, you've got to consider what type of mucosa is underneath the denture itself. Is it flabby or is it firm? Firm mucosa will have better support because it's harder, but because the mucosa is thinner, it's more likely to, you know, an area of trauma is more likely to occur in firm mucosa. The third one is implant borne um, support, which is something that we saw earlier in, a, in an implant retained denture. Finally, you've got stability, which essentially is a combination of the two, um, but it's no movement in any direction during function. The difference between Retention and support is that they are both, you know, when um, when the patient is at rest or static. Stability is no movement when the patient is functioning. So speaking, eating, things like that. Now let's touch upon acrylic versus cobalt chrome, which I briefly mentioned earlier, and then we'll go through the denture stages and and get on with the case. <laughs>
So these are the two main materials that you're going to need to know for your exam. And basically, you're going to need to know what are the advantages and disadvantages of both. And the good thing is, is that an advantage of one is typically a disadvantage of the other. So you don't have too many things to remember. Cobalt chrome dentures, which are the ones on the left, the advantage of them is that they're made of metal. They're made of cobalt chrome, so they're stronger in thin section, so they're much less likely to fracture. The benefit of being stronger in thin section is that you don't need to have as much material to kind of get the same result. So you can see with the two dentures here, the exact same teeth missing, but the cobalt chrome denture, you know, you've got a hole in the palate because that's, you know, that ring of metal is strong enough to withstand all of the occlusal forces and not break. So you don't need the thickness that the acrylic has. The fact that you can use less of this metal means that it's best, better tolerated. You get a better taste sensation because more of the tissue is going to be showing. And it's also more hygienic as well because it doesn't cover as much of the tissue. The disadvantages obviously of cobalt chrome is that you've got metal, so perhaps it's got poorer aesthetics, but typically the metal is, is well hidden. Um, it's difficult to add and repair to. So like I said earlier, if you're planning to do cobalt chrome, you need to plan ahead if the teeth have got good or poor prognosis. Um, you can't just you know add metal framework onto this to adjust it. So if you don't design it properly and teeth come out, you're not really gonna be able to, to modify that. You'd need a new denture. Also, in terms of the dentist, the clinician yourself, cobalt chrome as a material is more expensive and it takes slightly more chair time um, when you're with a patient because not only do you need to do a framework trying, but you need to do a wax trying as well. Whereas with an acrylic denture, there's no need to try any framework, so you go straight from the, you know, the bite and the secondary impressions to a, to a wax trying. Like I said, acrylic is, is the converse, is the opposite essentially. So acrylic has better aesthetics, so people say, because you, you, know, you get tooth colored material. It's more versatile. It can be used for a complete and a partial denture, whereas a cobalt chrome can only be used for a partial denture. Very easy to modify acrylic. If it, if it breaks or fractures, it's easy to repair. If a tooth is extracted, it's very easy to add it on and, and add more acrylic on because acrylic bonds to acrylic quite, uh, quite nicely. And it's cheaper, less stages to make. So in terms of us financially and, and um, economically, sometimes it makes more sense. The disadvantages, less tolerable, sorry, it's less tolerable, less hygienic, less strong, more prone to fracture um, and things like that. So let's run through typical denture appointments and, and how it would work. So for an acrylic denture, we're typically looking for around four appointments. So you've got your initial assessment and primary impressions. Your second appointment will be your master impressions. So any modifications, master impressions, um, wax bite if you need to, um, face bow and, and bite registration. Appointment three will be your wax try and appointment four will be your, your denture fit. Like I mentioned previously, if you have a cobalt chrome, in between appointment two and your wax try, you'll have appointment 2.5 where you will try in your cobalt chrome framework so for cobalt chrome it's typically five appointments for acrylic typically four that is if no need there's no need to adjust anything so denture appointment one you'll be doing your assessment everything we've spoken about before plus your primary impressions the primary impressions are taken to construct study casts these study casts can be used to help with treatment planning they can be used to help with denture design they can be used to fabricate special trays and fabricate um, wax rims as well. So really simple, simple appointment, um, but you can get a lot out of it. Typically, you'll use stock trays to take your primary impressions, and in these stock trays, you'll use alginate. Alginate is a very easy to use material. Uh, it's quick, it's cheap, it's, you know, it's pleasant to handle, um, and you don't need your super fine detail yet, so it's a, it's a suitable um, impression material as well. When you're looking at your primary impressions, you want to check for, you know, to check for a good impression, you need to look at things like, have you got all of the anatomy? Are the teeth fully captured? Has the denture been fully seated? If you look at the surface of the impression, is it free from voids, free from um, air blows, tears, drags, and things like this? Anything that will make the cast less, um, less accurate. 
hasn't been correctly extended both on the posterior region and in the flange regions as well and have you got rolled borders versus um versus knife edge borders all the things you need to look for in your in your primary impressions denture appointment number two is kind of where you get into the nitty gritty um and you really start planning your planning your dentures um Denture two is where you'll take your, your master impressions. So you need to make sure that all of your restorative work before is done. So extractions, restorations and, and stabilization and things like that. At the second appointment, you'll be taking the shade and you'll be doing various things to work out the position that the teeth are going to need to be in um, on the denture and the, the occlusal scheme as well. Um, so the types of things you might be doing are something like adjusting wax rims which you've got on the screen right now um, and wax rims are typically used in cases where you can't get a patient into ICP so you haven't got enough contact so you need to work out where the patient's teeth need to go um, in, in either a partial or, or definitely in a complete denture case um, so what the lab will do is they'll send you two wax blocks on casts like this and essentially you just need to put them in and you just need to mark landmarks and trim them back so that that looks as if that's where the teeth need to be set. So the kind of things that you're going to be um, going to be adjusting and marking are things like the uh, incisal display, the center line, the canine line, the lip support, the occlusal plane, um, and also the occlusal height and things like that. Um, just so that when you get your wax trying, that's where the acrylic teeth should be sitting. Once you've done this, then you need to take something which is called a bite registration. And essentially this is to help the lab articulate the two jaws together and determine either where the teeth meet or where the wax bite rims um, meet. This is an example of, um, this is an example of it on a, on a patient um, various stages. So applying it, biting, and then the end result. Obviously, this patient is 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 dentate and, and doesn't need dentures, but it kind of gives you an understanding of what you're looking for. Um, and you get the patient either between the wax or, or between the teeth. You apply something like Futar D. Get the patient to bite in ICP if that's what you're going to um, design the dentures in, or you get the patient to bite in RCP if they don't have those occlusal contacts, uh, like we spoke about after. And it will give you an impression and a print of how, how they, those two come together. If you look at the, the slide before and the, the wax on the right, you can see that there's little notches out of it. Those little notches are basically something called locating grooves. So when you put this, um, this Futar D or this impression material in, it will go into those grooves and it will help the lab then locate where those two wax um, rims bite together. Finally, some of the things you might do... Um, a face bow registration and well you're definitely going to do your your master impressions so a face bow is this funny little contraption on the left hand side something that i didn't use enough in university still don't use enough now um because we don't have one but need to need to use because essentially what it does is if you don't know where the patient's jaw bites together and the lab doesn't know where the patient's jaw bites together a face bow record will essentially tell you where the patient's maxilla is in relation to in relation to their skull so if you imagine you've got the horizontal plane across here your jaw will sit somewhere like this and when the lab is trying to articulate that they don't know exactly where that is and that's kind of where a face bow comes in so they can mount the maxillary cast on that articulator based on the information that you get from a face bow and then they can mount the, ma uh, the mandibular cast based on the position of your bite registration on those wax rims and get things locked together. So it's reproducible how the patient should be biting together. So the dentures are kind of made, you know, as accurately as possible um, to kind of alleviate the need for um, remakes and retries and, and things like that. Master impressions, they'll be the thing that you will do last at these appointments and those are kind of the impressions that the lab are going to make the the dentures the dentures on so these need to be a really really high detail impression um the impression material will depend on on the clinical situation you've got lots of things like um, you can use alginate you can use zoe impression compounds 
you can use silicone. It's all dependent on the clinical scenario. Um, you need to make sure that your special tray is correctly extended so you can see that there's green stick on here. A good way to, to do that is obviously to try it in and if you need to extend it, warm your green wax up. Uh, apply it around the, around the flanges and, and pop that in the patient's mouth whilst it's still warm and ask them to do movements, massage it and things like that to make it as accurate as possible. You really need to get detail of the teeth and the soft tissues in this instance. Especially if you have you know, a lower denture with um, free end saddles either side, you need to capture the, um, the shape of those ridges to make it as comfortable as possible. On the upper denture, you need to make sure that your palate is nice and accurate, so you've got good anatomy um, detailed there. You don't have any blows or air bubbles. Anything that might, at the end of it, make it instable or might make the, the denture uncomfortable. So yeah, lots of important steps um, from start to finish, but if you get this right, you're trying and you're fit, should move seamlessly. So appointment three, or appointment three and appointment four for Cobalt Chrome. Um, this is your wax and your, your framework try-in. So essentially, the lab will give you, for acrylic, they'll give you wax with the acrylic teeth that will mimic the, the denture how it will be, or they'll give you the cobalt, cobalt chrome metal framework, and then at the next appointment, the cobalt chrome framework um, with wax and acrylic teeth on as well. At this appointment, although you know it's not going to be the exact... Um, you know, the exact final denture. Information you need to get from this appointment is anything that you think you might need to adjust before it goes to acrylic and it's at an irreversible state. So these are things like retention support, support and stability, occlusion, so is it biting together properly? You need to assess is there correct flange extension, is it underextended or overextended and might need trimming or adjusting. The aesthetics, which is so important, You've obviously chosen the shade before with the patient, but this is the first time they can look at it. If the aesthetics aren't wrong, it's really easy to knock those teeth off and take, a, take another shade match. Um, and finally, the comfort. Obviously, the comfort is not going to be you know, the definitive comfort, but it's going to give the patient a pretty good idea of how it's going to feel. The extension of the flanges, the extension of the post-down region, um, how tight the clasps engage and, and, and things like that. If your patient is happy and you are happy and you confirm that, then you can move on to the final denture fit itself. So yeah, we're at the fit appointment now. The patient is probably sick of seeing you. So there are a few things that you want to check at this appointment before you can slowly usher them out the door. Um, the first thing you want to do is similarly to the crowns, you want to check the dentures on the cast. You want to check that they're made to spec, check that the undercuts are engaging, the clasps are engaging. Um, things like that. You want to run your finger on the fit surface and the flanges, check there's nothing sharp or rough that might traumatize the patient. When you get them in, you need to be checking for those three things we spoke about earlier, your retention, your support, and your stability. To check for the retention, essentially what you want to do is you want to seat the denture. If it's got clasps, check they're engaging. If it's a complete denture and you're looking for a peripheral seal, check for that suction and that, that vacuum up there. Once you've seated the denture, it's as simple as just trying to pull the denture out. If the denture doesn't move when you are pulling it out, then it's very unlikely that it's going to move when the patient is at rest. Checking the support essentially is doing the opposite. What you want to do is you want to put some pressure indicating paste on the fit surface and, and possibly some light body onto the um, edges of the flange. You want to seat the denture and you want to press bilaterally on the occlusal surfaces like this. You want to ask the, de uh, ask the denture, you want to ask the patient, is there any impingement? If there's not, take that denture out and assess the fit surface. If any of that pressure indicating paste has moved, um, then that's an area of possible impingement that needs to be smoothed. Finally, your stability. Again, test it when you've seated the dentures, but instead of pressing bilaterally like in support, you want to press unilaterally on the posterior teeth and also on the anterior teeth if they have them as well and just assess for any rocking. Once you've done these three, you can move on to things like your occlusion. So use your articulating paper and see if any adjustments need to be made. You can ask the patient, you know, are they happy with the aesthetics and the, and the comfort? Obviously, there's not much you can do about aesthetics. So you kind of want to manage this appropriately and, and perhaps say, you know, don't lead them into, into 
thinking negatively about them. Speech you can test by asking patients to say between the numbers 60 and 70. Obviously, speech might change, um, so you also want to warn them that it can take some time to adapt. And yeah, that's it. All of these checks, if they're all sufficient, then the patient is much more unlikely to come back. Um, but they might do, and there are instructions that we'll give you on the next slide on, on how to manage it and uh, appropriately. Denture instructions are a really simple um, Viva question. I think I got asked them at one point in one of the years that I were doing them, but it's something that perhaps people overlook and then maybe panic on the spot um, when it should be such a straightforward answer. So the kind of things that you need to, you know, the instructions that you need to give a patient, first and foremost, you've got to show them how to put it in and take it out um, before they leave the surgery. Then you want to advise them that it can take up to, you know, three to six months for speech, function, um, eating, talking, which is speech. Um, so basically speech and chewing can take up to three to six months to adapt. Um, it's not going to be an overnight thing. There might be discomfort to start with. Advise them of that, but say if, you know, if the discomfort is too much to put up with, then they need to come back in and, and have the denture adjusted. You need to advise them on how to keep it clean to reduce the risk of, you know, fungal infections, caries, perio and things like that. So this includes things like taking the denture out at night and cleaning it with a washing up liquid and a, and a soft bristle brush. You want to do this over a basin of water just in case they drop it, they, they won't fracture it. Um, it's a good idea to keep it in a sterilizing solution overnight to really clean that denture. Uh, and then, yeah, wish them, wish them well and, and ask them... You know, if there are any concerns, then give you a call and you, and you can make some adjustments. But it's as straightforward as that, really. Um, and yeah, that kind of brings us to the end, finally, of the indirect restorations. I feel like I've been filming it for ages. Um, presentation. What I'm going to do is there's going to be a case study coming up, but I'm going to upload that as a separate video because phone storage is running out. So I'm going to produce this one and then I'm going to... Um, upload it and, and try and get the case study out within a day or something like that. So yeah, thank you again for watching and, and stay tuned for the case presentation shortly.